so this video is going to be a bit of a weirder one because it's going to be a lot more personalized than my other videos are, and by personalized I don't mean that this video is going to be all about me or anything, but rather that I'm going to be putting more of my opinions on external topics into this video due to their tangential relationship with some of what Oshinoko has to bring to the table. Some people are going to roll their eyes when I get to talking about what I think about K-pop in this day and age because they're just here to listen to some lukewarm takes on a popular anime. But this tangential relationship was an important part of my overall experience and me talking about Oshinoko without this aspect would mean I wouldn't be able to express exactly why some parts of the anime were as effective as they were. Oshinoko is pretty good. I could easily see myself recommending it to anybody, especially if you're watching this video near the time of its release since season 2 isn't too far away. Consider this to be your spoiler warning. This video will contain spoilers for season 1 of the Oshinoko anime. One specific topic I find myself growing increasingly more cynical about over the years is that of K-pop. I don't necessarily engage with the genre or industry anymore, but it is something that I'm constantly exposed to thanks to my surroundings, and something that has gotten on my nerves year after year is how fake the entire industry feels. Pretty much all demonstrations of personality that I've seen on TV have always felt so excessively cheery, and overly polished, it almost feels too clean, leaving a kind of uncanniness to it all. I haven't done research into this, nor am I engaged enough with it to get into the truly nitty gritty details, but as an outsider looking in, there's a very homogenous factory produced feel to K-pop idols that I can never shake off. And this isn't a comment about their music at all, because I don't go out of my way to listen to K-pop outside of the stuff that I grew up with. This feeling stems from pretty much any display of their personalities shown on things like interviews or reality shows I do enjoy watching, a little Korean <laughs> reality TV here and there. Whoever the real person may be, and whatever their real name may be, it feels like the front of being a K-pop idol entirely smothers it out in exchange for a polished, marketable product rather than a person. Nothing encapsulates this feeling more to me than a phenomena called Ending Yojong, which translates to Ending Fairy. It's when an idol finishes a performance and the camera is on them, so they look right at the camera and do some sort of gesture and or put on an expression. And while this is an immature way to further the discussion, <laughs> I find this phenomena to be cringe. I suspect this feeling comes from my perception of how forced and disingenuous it feels every time I see it. Don't forget to maintain that clean facade and look pretty for the camera. Maybe these are some outrageously boomer takes and I need to go outside for once in my life, but the point of all this generalized ranting about K-pop is that I already had a very skeptical outlook onto idols as a whole, which made the opening of the anime echoing a lot of these same thoughts become a very interesting experience. Aqua's uniquely jaded and skeptical perspective allows him to see right through a lot of the industry's surface, providing a steady stream of transparency that allows the anime's signature cynical tone to settle in as it strongly resonated with my own skepticisms towards the industry. And while the anime doesn't necessarily retain this specific interest all the way to the finish line due to it deviating away from exclusively focusing on the idle side of show business, it made me a lot more willing to go along with the heavily cynical tone of the anime and helped bridge the way to other facets of Oshinoko that would get their hooks in me. I don't think the anime offers any revolutionary or groundbreaking commentary, but it is refreshingly negative enough that it works, and the anime's overall dark tone set against the bright lights of the show business setting is one of its strongest elements. Another way in which the opening episode successfully catered to my personal tastes was in the way in which it very happily indulged in the consumerism of the industry, the desire to push out a product over anything else. The production staff is proudly unimpressed with B. Komachi and finds them to be nothing special. Ruby and Aqua mindlessly consume what's being thrown at them without second thought. Aqua isn't maybe entirely mindless about his consumption of media, but Ruby just eats that shit up. Baby Ruby also goes out of her way to declare Twitter wars in defense of this product she is so obsessed with. It once again reinforces the same chains of negativity that bind my perspective, but from a different angle, this time from the way of the target audience rather than those directly involved. The sheer length of the first episode goes a long way here too. It is a hour and a half long. My first impression of the length was that it was just kind of this long to prove that it could be this long, but on my second viewing I came to the conclusion that there was a more practical purpose behind it, which is that the episode's length allows itself to link together a lot of different angles on the same topic back to back to back. If these were all to be segmented into individual episodes, then there would need to be a steady process of building up into an episode and then winding down from it, which naturally takes away from the flow or momentum of an episode, 
And I think those things are key here because the story presented in episode 1 is basically the prologue for everything else. It's quite a lengthy one, but I don't think there's much that can be trimmed out of this episode without damaging its importance to the rest of the anime. All the content in this prologue section is important, yet there is so much of it that it becomes difficult to mold it into the more traditional formatting of anime, that being 20 odd minute episodes released close to some multiple of 12. So what about these other facets of Oshinoko that got their hooks in me? The strong opening bridges the way to these facets, so where does this bridge take us? This bridge takes us to two characters, but it also brings us to the biggest criticism that I can toss towards the show, which is that much of the anime's most interesting moments past its opening are hard carried by the select characters. Outside of the opening, anytime we're looking at a scene that doesn't revolve around these two characters, it all feels like it melts together into background noise. It's not bad or boring, but it is fairly unremarkable as far as I'm concerned. But the other characters are fine, but they're just nowhere near as interesting as the best characters the anime has to offer, which results in a kind of weird ebb and flow throughout the entire thing as certain episodes feel like mandatory plot progression there to fill the gaps rather than a thoughtful exploration of more complex topics and feelings that the best episodes have to offer. A big reason for this is that a lot of this mandatory plot progression doesn't really go anywhere, but this is to be expected given that these elements of the anime are clearly intended to not really go anywhere. Aqua solving the identity of his father is the backbone of Oshinoko, and while it takes a few steps forward, the biggest step forward is washed out by the fact that it comes out right at the end and has no room to see development. Most of Ruby's idle dreams also fall into the same bucket where a lot of it is just her bumming around the office with Kana until Mem joins, and even when Mem joins it still doesn't feel like as if they get a whole lot done. The idle performance is kind of squeezed in their last minute because it really is squeezed in their last minute from a story perspective. I think both of these things have a legitimate excuse as to their current state, with Aqua's detective work being a clear slow burner while Ruby's idol dreams basically just finished their prologue here. But having a legitimate excuse doesn't take away from the fact that these things are just so much less interesting than the enemy's best moments and frankly feels like a bit of a slog to get through, which was especially true during the rewatch. I think once season 2 rolls around then things should be better on both fronts, since the new iteration of B Komachi can finally get started and be themselves and Aqua is diving headfirst into somewhere with a more clear direction towards his father's identity through the Tokyo Blade stage play. Let's get around to looking at what exactly all this stuff pales in comparison to. That That's the wrong two, okay. Uh, <laughs> the first of these is Ego Surfing, which is the title of episode 6. More importantly, it's the second half of episode 6. I've never been in a situation even remotely close to what Akane goes through in this episode, but I find it to be weirdly understandable. I can understand what it feels like to let negativity and toxicity get in your own head and create an echo chamber even though you understand that there's nothing good to come of it to keep exposing yourself to said negativity. There's a faint hope that by constantly checking in on the negativity that you'll be finally there to see it begin to fade away into understanding or that you might even find one comment that takes your side and acts as a beacon of emotional light. We can see this in the anime perfectly when Akane comes across a comment that starts positively but ends by saying the commenter can no longer support Akane. It's definitely far less malicious or violent compared to a lot of the other comments that fly by the screen, but that just makes it worse because the tamer nature of the comment feels like a painful and personalized exception. You don't want to talk about it with other people because you don't want people to worry about you and let this negativity ruin other people's days. It's already upsetting enough to get into trouble something you did on accident, but it enters a whole nother level when it devolves into extended targeted bullying as it is here. It's an absolutely frustrating situation, but if exposed to toxicity long enough, then there's also a good chance that you begin to believe that maybe I do deserve what I'm getting, and you become the walls of your own echo chamber. From the outside looking in, it's so easy to tell somebody to just stay away from these comments and don't think about them, but when every single one of these comments is coming for your neck, it's difficult to resist the weight put on by this supposed responsibility people that don't understand the situation pushed onto you. Anonymity is a hell of a drug, and it makes people say and do things that you would never do to someone if you were face to face with them. I'm sure we've all spent enough time on the internet to know that this is just a fact in this day and age. The way the anime treats Akane in this episode got me to think a lot about both the weight of anonymity as well as the spaces in which not just I but so many people occupy nowadays. It has never been easier to both put yourself out there as well as hide behind a veil of anonymity, which really is pretty ironic, isn't it? And while I understand that I didn't really talk about exactly what happens in the episode or what parts of the episode makes it so good, I think what I've just gone through here kind of goes to prove that the episode 
had me constantly thinking about it the entire time that I was watching it, which I think is probably the best compliment I could give to an episode like this, that it had me actively engaged with it the entire time and approaching it on a much more personal level rather than just taking it in for what it was on the surface level and then forgetting about it once the next episode started. The second aspect of the anime that overshadows much of Oshinoko was Arima Kana. I really enjoyed what they did with this character, especially near the very end. In fact, I'd probably say the way in which they wrapped up this character is probably why I feel largely positive about Oshinoko as a whole. If the ending was just kind of whatever, then my overall feelings for the anime might have ended up as Oshinoko starts pretty good, but peters out into being just okay outside of this one random great episode, and I probably wouldn't have bothered with this video. She's introduced very well in episode 1 by being this little bratty kid actor who gets really upset when Aqua accidentally upstages her on camera, so she starts crying and throwing a tantrum about how the scene needs to be shot again because she got upstaged. As much as I love watching child actors get the short end of the stick because I hate them, especially in Korean dramas. Good <laughs> oh, I cannot stand child actors. Part of me initially did think that she got as upset as she did because of the very unstable nature of being an up-and-coming actor and that she envisioned one bad performance being the end of her career. This scene brought back a particular thought I had a long time ago of how there were so many idols that I saw once or twice on TV only to never see them ever again. Part of this is of course the fact that I don't actively follow this stuff so maybe they're doing fine and I'm just never around to catch their appearances on screen especially as we get deeper and deeper into a world where live television programming is becoming less and less relevant. But on the darker side of things, perhaps these groups I only ever saw once or twice didn't make enough of a profit early enough and were disbanded at some point, and now who knows what those people are up to. But it turns out that she's just a brat being a brat, and the director even comments that in order to make it in the industry, having good connections to other actors and staff is key, and behaviors like this won't make it far. Her future appearances, however, have piled on several layers onto her, turning her into this red onion of a character that I ended up really, really liking. A lot of these layers can be conveniently split into two different portions of the anime, given that Kana, for the most part, takes a backseat during the reality dating show episodes. You have the first batch with Kana and Aqua filming that terribly acted but still well-produced live-action manga adaptation, and then the second batch near the end with the days leading up to and the day of Kana taking the stage as an idol. I like both of these a lot, especially the second. In the first, Kana undeniably shows a level of maturity and a better understanding of the fine balance between what you as the performer want and what the industry wants out of you. She's far more amicable and far less of a pain in the ass to interact with in those episodes even if she is still insistent. And while she's not afraid to voice her issues with the production, she's also willing to stay silent when necessary to ensure smooth sailing of the production and to keep her career in a positive light, but even with this, it's not so much Kana's acting talent that continues getting her jobs like she believes, but rather other, more convenient facts like her status as a freelancer making her pretty cheap, or her being easy to work with that's cinching her position so in addition to being a competent actor, it's a compact yet interesting set of traits in regards to both an individual character and the larger ecosystem they reside within that I think is on good display here. Near the end, Kana's self-esteem has evidently hit rock bottom, but it's revealed that it's been like this for a long time. Turns out that her career hit a pretty bad downward trajectory a long time ago due to factors outside of her control, like growing up. And while it seems to have stabilized for now, she is nowhere near the fame and success of her child actor days. When she discusses this in any shape or form, whether it's through a flashback or in a self-deprecating, jaded fashion, Kana almost makes it sound like she's lost her passion for her career and that she's just doing it for the paychecks with how nonchalantly she glosses over her failures. While I don't think this is the case, there seems to be a lack of this spark of enthusiasm in her words, which all culminates into the moment where Kana admits that her reluctance to get on stage is not caused by her failing solo, but rather her own failures dragging other people down with her. Ruby's career has yet to begin while Mems has been nothing but successful, so it seems as though Kana feels that she'd be doing nothing but tainting their bright futures. Kana lacks the confidence to establish herself as a center for Bikomachi and only does it because the other two quite literally aren't good enough to do it. Kana refuses to take any compliments and views compliments as people trying to manipulate her and that no one really bothers trying to learn about who she is or understand how she feels. The interaction she has with Pieon, in air quotes, on the balcony is best example of this. There's an irony to how she talks about internet criticism in regards to Akane a couple episodes ago, when Kana herself has become her own echo chamber replaying the same cynical comments to a point that she just views these as reality. 
But in the end, the show at the Japan Idol Festival seems to have reignited some kind of fire within her, it seems like. Watching Aqua go out of his way to cheer frantically for her at the show has made her realize that instead of waiting for people to want her, she will do things that will make people want her. This sort of passionate response is something that she can earn. I'm really looking forward to season 2. The things that the anime ended with fills me with a lot of enthusiasm through an interesting premise that takes a swing at a different side of entertainment via live theater, and it has already established a solid baseline cast with my two favorite characters being guaranteed to return, and an already interesting dynamic between them having been teased in the final episode. There's also some hope that certain plot lines that felt less substantial here in Season 1 will have a better time in Season 2 now that a, the resurrection of Bikomachi has concluded what was essentially the prologue, and B, it seems as if Aqua is getting closer to some more substantial evidence. And that's it for the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider liking it and maybe even subscribing to the channel. As far as the next video is concerned, I think I'm probably going to do a video on Freerun, um, and maybe the Apothecary Diaries. I'm a lot less sure about the second one, but... Uh, we'll see how that pans out, but free run is probably going to happen, and, oh, yeah, I mean, that's it, so, yeah, once again, thank you so much for watching, uh, and I'll see you in the next video. I did not care for the opening. <laughs> it insists upon itself, Lois. <laughs> Ah, uh, I like the money pit. All right, goodbye.